All right. Well, hey, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about building high-performance marketing websites. So a little different than Web3, but uh, hopefully it can, it can be interesting. So uh, yeah, my name's Lee. Well, no clicker. That's OK. Uh, my name's Lee. I'm the Director of Developer Relations at Vercel. And if you haven't heard of Vercel, it's a platform for essentially building really fast front ends and really fast websites. And we're also the creators of a React front end called Next.js. So just a quick show of hands, who here has heard of Next.js? Oh, I love it. Awesome. My React people, I love it. Um, so at Vercel, I, uh, I lead our community and our developer education efforts. And I spend a lot of time talking to developers about just how you build really fast websites. So my goal for the next 20 minutes is you'll leave here having learned at least one tip to make your next site faster. So first, before we dive into it, I want to talk about what is a marketing website? I think everyone might have a different definition of what they say when they say marketing. So I'll give my, uh, my definition here so that we can set the context of the talk. So I would talk, I'm talking mostly about e-commerce, media sites, and software sites. So it can even be more granular than that too. Like if you look at this example here of target.com, this homepage is their product, but it's also a marketing page that is impacting their funnels and conversions and getting people essentially into their product. So pages that drive growth of their product. Uh, and the more granular, the better as well, too. So those are the type of pages and sites that we're going to be talking about a little bit today. And I want to talk about the expectations from customers and developers of how we build these sites versus maybe the reality of what it looks like when you go to one of these sites or if you're a developer trying to build one of these with React, for example. And then finally, I'll wrap up and uh, show an example and give you some takeaways for your next site. So first, let's talk about expectations. So as a customer, as a visitor of a marketing website, you go to a .com, what do you expect? Well, first, you expect it to be fast. You want it to be fast wherever you're at. This is the cover letter of your business. You don't want this site to be down. You want it to be fast all the time. And with more and more of the world being online and just you know, a couple clicks away from the internet, it's important that you're building global first. And you want to have great performance regardless of where your customers or visitors are at in the world. Second, you want to try to be online as much as possible. There's probably a Web3 tie in here somewhere. But uh, <laughs> if you think about e-commerce, for example, you know, this is your virtual store. You don't want to close the doors of your virtual business and stop allowing people to you know, give you your money and purchase your products. If it's a software site, you don't want people to not be able to sign up and use your product. So it's important we try as best as possible to keep our, our sites online. Uh, and then finally, from a customer perspective, we expect that the experience is personalized based on the visitor. So we want to see content that's relevant to me. If I'm on an e-commerce site, I want to see products I've previously bought and I want to buy again. If I'm on a media site, I want to see content that's localized to my language. If I'm on a software site, I want to see my user preferences impact that experience. So that's the customer perspective. But the way we actually get to there is through developers. So what do developers expect when they're trying to build out marketing websites? Well, as a developer, I want to have fast iterations. This is, this is number one for me. I want it to be fast to make changes and get my product and get my code into production in front of my customers. So we want to see content updates immediately. And we don't want to have to wait for you know, a 30-minute, hour-long build that just slows down our iteration cycle. Secondly, we want to empower our teams to experiment, and experiment as easy as possible. So really great marketing and growth teams, the people building your dot-coms, they're running experimentation tests, they're running A-B tests, they're trying out different things, and they're trying to ultimately see how they can optimize a click-through rate or a conversion rate or some, some funnel. Everything is funnels. Uh, and finally, developers expect that they're enabled with powerful tools. I think we all know performance and building a fast website takes a lot of work. So ideally, as a developer, you expect to be given tools that make it easy for you to deliver a great user experience. And we want our tooling to help enable that. 
So that's the expectation, right? Everyone's, you know, we're at a high right now. So what's, what's the reality if you actually go visit some of these websites? You know, we, maybe it doesn't add up as much. So <laughs> let's first talk about the user experience. So first, we want to be fast everywhere. But you look at a lot of websites, and you know, they're just in US East. They're just in a single region, and they're often serving a global audience still. So instead of that, we want to put our code and we want to put our application as close to our customers as possible, um, which is going to give them better page load times and just overall a better experience. So that could be enabled through a, a CDN or content delivery network or an edge network. We want our sites to be online as much as possible, but when you browse the web today, you notice that a lot of businesses struggle from availability issues. It's difficult when they're dealing with custom tooling or hand-rolled infrastructure to keep their site online all the time or as much as possible, it's an aspirational goal, and uh, really design their site with an architecture in mind that optimizes for availability. So not even the entire site, we can even get down to a per page level. If my about page is down, I don't want my home page to be down where people can sign up in an ideal world, right? Um, and then finally, the reality of user experience is we want it to be personalized, but often due to the tooling choices we make or the architecture choices we make, it makes it difficult or impossible to achieve the desired user experience we want. Um, and that ultimately ties directly back to the developer experience of how you're building these applications. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the realities of developer experience. We want to iterate fast. You don't want to be blocked by your tools. You want to make it easy to get code into production. But you know, complicated CI CD pipelines or just slow infrastructure for actually getting your code to production, having these slow builds, will have developers playing games or switching over to Twitter and just looking at the latest hot takes on, uh, on Twitter. And uh, we want to do better than that. Secondly, we want to be able to experiment easily. But the reality is that you visit the web today and we're faced with a lot of layout shift. And unfortunately, one major consequence or one major cause of this is client-side only experimentation. Teams get a requirement that says, hey, we need to be able to test different content on the home page, and they choose a solution that ultimately ends up in a worse user experience and worse core web vitals, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then we also expect that we're given powerful tools but in reality, there's no toolkit for the web. It's difficult to build really fast websites, and developers have to wrangle with images and fonts and scripts, and it's easy to make mistakes. And the cost of making that mistake is difficult, and they have to you know, kind of fend for themselves and face this iceberg of the web. This is my uh, fun little analogy here. And really the analogy is, you know, we've all seen Titanic, but <laughs> from a distance, this iceberg, you know, doesn't seem, that, doesn't seem that bad, but you, you know, peel back a layer of the onion, you look under the water a little bit here, and you realize, oh, there's a lot more than meets the eye. The same analogy actually applies really well to the web, because you look at the web as a developer, what does it take to build a really great website? Well, often you're dealing with images and fonts and scripts and SEO and internationalization and just so accessibility, like so much stuff here as a developer, you have to consider to deliver the type of user experience that your customers want. And I personally think that e-commerce is probably the pinnacle of the iceberg of the web. You look at this product page, seems pretty simple. It's just a picture of a chair and some buttons. Can't be that hard, right? But then you, you, know, you peel back the layers of the onion a little bit here and you realize not only do we have images and fonts, we also have so many third-party scripts, just a ridiculous amount of third-party scripts, to show recommendations based on buying history, to collect reviews, to give rewards, to repeat customers, to allow people to buy now and pay later, to talk to customer support. I'm sure we've all seen the intercom widgets in the bottom right of websites. Uh, and then, you know, maybe even more advanced is kind of post-purchase email flows or some kind of reminder about abandoned carts. You get these requirements as developers, but then often the step between requirement and implementing <laughs> ends up in a you know, kind of subpar user experience. And we have 
tools that enable us to measure a subpar experience. And one of those is called Core Web Vitals. So Core Web Vitals allow us to measure the experience of real visitors on our website. So real customers who are out using our website, what is it actually like for them? Are they succeeding? Are they having a bad time? There's really three that we're going to talk about today. The first is LCP, or Largest Contentful Paint, which is essentially the loading speed of your page. So in this example, the hero image, or the main image of a shoe here, the faster we can get that image on the page, the better user experience you're going to have. So we want to optimize for that and get that value as low as possible. The second is first input delay, or FID. This is essentially your experience interacting with a web page. So you go to a website, the page loads, you get some HTML, some JavaScript. You want to be able to click things. You want to be able to click a button. You don't want to see a disabled button. You don't want to see a loading spinner. You just want to be able to use the experience. And the third one is cumulative layout shift, or CLS. And this measures overall layout stability. So I'm sure we've all seen a web experience where you go to click something, then the ad banner pops in, you accidentally click the wrong button that you know charges your card or something. It's brutal. There's way too much of this on the web today. And luckily, this layout shift metric gives us a way for us to track this and ideally improve it over time. So these are the three core web vitals, LCP, FID, CLS. And some values have been defined to help developers understand what's good, what's kind of eh, and then maybe where we need to spend some more time as a development team to kind of optimize this. So we have these values, and it's important as developers and as development teams to track this over time and to understand how it affects our website. So there's a bunch of tools out there that can do this. The one I'm most familiar with is because I work at Vercel, but we have a tool called Vercel Analytics. It allows you to track your core web vitals over time, kind of bundles it up into one big green circle that is hopefully closer to 100. And then you can kind of track it over time based on some deployments that you've made. So if you've you know, made a change that isn't great, you can revert that back and, and improve those vitals. So let's talk about an example of how we can make a really fast website. And I can really only speak to things that I've personally contributed with or personally worked on. And the most recent one is working on Vercel.com. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the design decisions we've made, some of the rendering patterns we've chose, and uh, yeah, talk, to, talk about some takeaways. So let's start with user experience. How have we managed to get a website that's fast wherever you're at in the world and is personalized to your experience? Well, we're using a toolkit, and a toolkit that enables us to kind of avoid that iceberg by giving us optimizations for images and fonts and scripts, ultimately resulting in a good user experience and good core web vitals. Now, from a marketing perspective, we don't manage the infrastructure here. Like, we're dogfooding our own platform. Technically, there's infrastructure team who's managing the platform. But as a customer of Vercel for our marketing website, we don't have to worry about spinning up our own server or managing that CI CD pipeline. We're essentially offloading that to our you know, DevOps team. Um, so we dog food our own platform there. Secondly, we put our code as close to our visitors as possible. So we distribute all of our assets around the world at every, every edge in our network. And that decreases the round trip latency between user and a browser, making a request, getting some code, and coming back to the, the person. So this user experience is really customized based on the visitor, and I'll show an example of that in a second. Secondly, talking about developer experience, we want to enable everyone building this experience to be able to iterate quickly. And that's not only local iterations. So in this example, you can see the uh, Re React Fast Refresh console output showing like you know 50 to 100 milliseconds live updates when you make a change and you see it updated. It's also review iterations, build iterations, deploy iterations. We want to make it fast to get that code out to production. Secondly, we want to enable the entire team to experiment really easily. And in this instance, we're, you're using Next.js. So there's a tool called middleware that enables us to run A-B tests and run experiments without introducing client-side layout shift. And then finally, we're, like I said, we're using Next.js in this instance. And it gives us some tools 
that help us combat the iceberg of the web. So we have an image component, we have some script component, we have web font optimization. We also have what we're calling conformance, which is a built-in ESLint integration to kind of help developers understand if they're doing something that could affect performance before it gets into production. And then we're also working with the Lighthouse team. We have a PR here you can check out to actually put in recommendations directly in Lighthouse so that you can understand what specific Next.js thing is, is affecting uh, the site. So let's, let's go back to the example I talked about earlier. Um, in this one, we're fetching some dynamic content from a CMS, and we're using it to display a banner at the top of the page. And we want to do this without introducing layout shift, because we, like, we don't like layout shift. So maybe we want to change it from unlock a better front-end workflow to Vercel acquires McDonald's, and now we have the fastest McFlurries. Like, I don't know, something like that. <laughs> And uh, you know, it's not really banners, too. We also want to do this kind of experimentation or personalization based on elements on the page. So maybe we want to change the CTA to some different button text and measure that funnel and see if one version performs better than the other, again, without layout shifts. So how, as a developer, would I actually do this? We might decide that we want to kind of build our entire site as a series of static assets, and we have this, you know, we have two different requests here, maybe one to actually get this HTML and another one to get some data from a CMS. And because we've kind of pre-generated all this stuff and we put it at an edge somewhere close to our visitors, we can do this pretty fast. So if you look at the little outline around here, everything on this page is static. Now, there's a trade-off to this, which is we want to show a new banner. So let's do a new deployment. We'll make a change in our CMS. And then after that has completed, well, now we can see this new content that has a completely new banner. Now, this might work for some teams. But often, the blocker of it takes an entire new deployment to see changes is enough for teams to start reconsidering, OK, is this what we want to do? let alone not even talking about personalizing things based on the incoming request. So maybe you want to do some server rendering. And in this instance, you know, first request to kind of get some HTML. See, I just have this outline here. As a user, the user experience is I'm looking at the browser loading screen until we get back something. And then I have another API call. Maybe it takes 200 milliseconds. Maybe it takes 500 milliseconds to fetch back the content from my CMS. And we're in a situation right now where it's all or nothing. Either we have all of our content or we have none of our content. So you're only as fast as your back end or your cache. So basically, we want to try to decrease that and make it as fast as possible. So one thing that we're experimenting with right now in Next.js is streaming on the server using something that we call the edge runtime. The way this works is after that first request comes in to actually get some HTML, some JavaScript on the page, even though we haven't got our banner from our CMS, we're still able to give the user some visual indication that the page is, is starting to complete. And you know, maybe there's a navigation button on there that's already interactive that they can go leave the page if they want to. Um, but now, as our request finishes, to actually get that data back from our CMS, we can stream in new new results and show that new content as soon as it's available. And this ultimately we think will provide the best user experience uh, in terms of getting rid of the all or nothing data fetching situation. But we can do better uh, in the future. And there's some interesting research being done here to think about how we can optimize this in, in the best way. So what if we took the same kind of mental model of components, but we applied it to how we cache and invalidate content on a page. So if you remember, I had the all green outline on the first slide for SSG. What if we had develop preview ship is all static, but the top part, the banner, that's actually some dynamic content. So that's the only part that's going to have some kind of invalidation or content's going to change. So let's say we go to our CMS, we change our content, we change the, the banner to be something else. We do this cache invalidation this push event 
maybe a contentful webhook triggers some changes, and it pushes out to all of our different edges in your edge network, and it sends out this new information that says, hey, the new banner is deploy with confidence, and it updates that edge cache. Now, on the next request, you can get back that content immediately at the same speed that you had as a static website, uh, as you can see with our, our little diagram and our new updated banner here. So this is, this is exciting for me because it's trying, to, it's trying to refocus on how we deliver the best experience to our customers and giving developers the tools to do that. So that's one example on that. A couple other things I want to talk about in terms of marketing experiences that I find uh, really helpful. So one is when your product and your marketing pages feel like an integrated experience. It doesn't feel like you're on a, a subdomain or on a completely different website with a completely different design system. Um, in the case of Vercel, we have, when I'm logged in on the top right, I have my avatar, and I can just quickly jump into the product. This isn't necessarily a Vercel specific thing. I think GitHub does this really well. Uh, you know, I'm, if I'm looking at their marketing pages, which to be honest, how often do we look at the GitHub marketing pages? Not, not that often. But if I am looking at the GitHub marketing pages, I can very quickly jump into my pull requests or my issues, and it all feels like one part of a big cohesive unit. The more interesting thing for me is if you scroll down on the Brussel homepage, we actually have this step that allows developers to just quickly import their repository and, and deploy and get started immediately. So if I'm logged out, I see these prompts to connect to my Git source of choice or start from a template and get deployed. But if I'm logged in, I see that I can you know, see some repos that I've recently pushed and I can just really quickly click import, kind of be off to the races. So this is effectively like a, a full client side application. We're changing this content on the client side based on, you know, based on the user preferences and the, what I've recently imported. So takeaways. How can we deliver these great marketing experiences? So I think, first and foremost, you should measure what matters. I've talked a lot about uh, Core Web Vitals. I've talked a lot about user experience and how, uh, how that actually affects your customers. At the end of the day, Core Web Vitals are affecting your ranking in Google search in comparison to your customers. So optimizing for good performance and a good experience it's not only for your customers, it also has a direct impact on your business. And I think that's why a lot of people are starting to really tune into you know, their, their, their rankings and their understanding of, of performance there. And just a quick note on this too, I've talked a lot about Core Web Vitals, which is field data. That doesn't necessarily mean that Lighthouse or other lab data sources are bad. It's just another tool in your uh, tool belt to understand how to measure performance. Uh, ideally, with lab testing, you would do that before you get into production, and then you use field data once you're already in production. The second takeaway is that you want to optimize everything for fast iterations. The faster you can iterate, the faster you can build a better product, whether it's, again, local iterations, reviewing and collaborating with your team, previewing, building, deploying code. The faster you can iterate on that, the better off you'll be. So pick tools that enable you to move quickly and invest in your tools. You want to make it easy for developers to build the user experience that you want, unblock them, and help them ship faster. Thanks. <laughs>